But as we go through the sixth chapter, which is really focused on, it's really focused on sex, we talked about who the high priest is allowed to marry. And now as we move towards the end of the chapter, we're going to move from the high priest to a regular priest. But in order to understand the halacha of the regular priest, which, by the way, applies to an ordinary, an ordinary Israelite as well. So the Gemara will explain that this Mishnah, which, which mentions the word priest, actually applies to any man in Israel. In order to understand this Mishnah, we need to understand the word Ayelonit. And we've had this word before, actually, but we sort of come across it in passing. Ayelonit. It might be derived from the uh, the word ayel, which is actually a um, uh, um, a ram, a ram, a male uh, sheep. Um, it, and it, it refers to a woman. This is some kind, this is not a hermaphrodite, but it's a it's a woman who quite of who doesn't have female sexual organs. So in other words, she is a woman. I guess she's got two X chromosomes, probably. But although they might not have been able to detect that accurately in the time of the Mishnah, but she doesn't have a womb or anyway, she doesn't have reproductive organs. She's this is not someone this is not a, a woman who's infertile. It's someone who doesn't have reproductive organs. In other words, there's absolutely no possibility of her being able to bear children. That's an ilonit. And I've just brought the definition from Jastro on the source sheet. Actually, he says someone who is wombless, who's someone who's incapable of conception. That's how Jastro defines it. And the Mishnah will then go on to discuss the regular Kohen. And as we've said, the Gemara extends this to anybody. And the Mishnah explains, Kohen Hediot, lo isa et Ailonit. A regular priest may not marry an Ailonit. A priest can't marry an Ailonit. And why not? Well, let's carry on reading down the Mishnah. Um, and Eila Imken, I'm, I'm sorry, there's a, I'm going slowly here because there's, a, there's an, actually a typo on the source sheet. Ela um Kohen et your law is at Ayonit, Ela in Ken Yeshlo Isha Uvanim. Only if he already has a wife and children. So, well, I suppose we're getting towards the question of the myths of procreation. Is it permitted for a man to marry someone with whom he can't have children? And actually, the Mishnah suggests that okay, he can marry her, but he should already have children at that stage. And Rabbi Yudha is going to say, um, Rabbi Yudha Omer, Af yesh lo isha vanim lo Rabbi Yudha is actually going to be stricter. The halacha will not follow Rabbi Yudha. But Rabbi Yudha says, even though he's got a wife and children, he shouldn't marry an Ailonit since because she's a harlot, as mentioned in the Torah. That's a difficult, difficult idea. And the, I think the, the Gemara explains Rabbi Yudah saying that if you marry someone who's child, who can't have children, then you're only marrying her. You're only marrying her because you enjoy sex. And I mean, the halacha doesn't follow Rabbi Yudah. And, I'm not sure the halacha forbids this because, you know, you might carry on being married after having children. But but th that's the view of Rabbi Yudah. We don't use this. We do not use this term harlot. We only use it for rather specific circumstances or specific in terms of the chachamim. And we, again, I think we will find this very surprising and very unnatural to our way of thinking. But the, I, I suppose the sages of the Mishnah are living in Roman times and they're seeing the sexual ethics of the peoples around them. And I mean, not just Roman times, because they're seeing the idolatrous 
inhabitants of the rest of that part of the world. So, so they say, what is the definition of a harlot? Ein zona eila gioret. A harlot is only someone who's a female convert. Umshukhereret, or a freed slave. This is refers to a freed um, foreign slave, not a freed Jewish slave. And someone who's been subjected to illicit intercourse. And the bar, bar, bila, and the partner explains what illicit intercourse is. He says, We're talking about those types of intercourse which violate negative or positive commandments. Now, I mean, negative commandments we've already read about in the the first part of the chapter. So, for example, a um, divorced woman to a Kohen Gadol. There's a prohibition. There's a prohibition. And so that's an example of what the Bath Nur would say. That's um, Bilat Znut. It, it's a, a harlotry if you if you get married on, on, a, on a prohibition like that. Now you can, val- you can invalidate a positive commandment. I'm not sure. And I've been racking my brains. And then he gives some other examples. And all the more so those relationships which are liable to karet, to cutting off, or to death at the hands of a bet din. So these would be more kind of significant, kind of incestuous relationships. And then the bar finishes, But the person who has a sexual relationship with an unmarried woman hasn't made her a harlot. So harlotry doesn't, doesn't, seen to cover you know what we probably call today kind of regular regular promise regular promiscuity now if we're saying that a regular priest kohen ediot loisa et aelonit doesn't can't marry an aelonit then we're presupposing or we're pre-assuming the existence of a mitzvah of um of having children right there's only reason why he's i mean it seems that he's forbidden to marry a a woman who doesn't have a womb because she can't have children so presumably there is a mitzvah of having children and this is the mitzvah which the sixth chapter is going to close on a person shouldn't abstain from being fruitful and multiplying so we began the sixth chapter with the the um, relationship between the y- Yabam and Yavama. And we're going to close it with kind of a regular married relationship. A person shouldn't abstain from being fruitful and multiplying. Until he or, unless he already has children. So if, if he already has children, he can abstain. And the reference here is to Adam. And we'll see in a minute as to whether Adam here is refers to the male or whether we're talking about humankind. But let's let's go on a little further. Beit Shammai Omrim, Beit Shammai say, Shnei Zacharim, Beit Shammai say two males. You have to have two male children before ceasing from being fruitful and multiplying. Uveit Hillel Omrim, Zacharu Nekeva, Shinemar, Zacharu Nekeva, Braham. And Beit Hillel say, you have to have a boy and a girl, and we're going to quote a verse: "Zacharu um, nekeva v'ra'am." Ela told us it's it's from Bereshit. It's these are the generations of man. Man was made in the image of God. Zacharu nekeva v'ra'am. Man, male and female were created together. So, what happens if if he gets married? What happens if if um, we, you know, what happens if the marriage doesn't produce children? A man marries a woman and lives with her for 10 years and she hasn't had a child. The 10 years, I think, reminds us of the 10 years that Avraham lived in the land of Israel. So Avraham and Sarah didn't have children. And they didn't have children for much of their married life. And then they went to the land of Israel. Perhaps the land of Israel is seen in the 
eyes of the halakha as a place that should be fruitful you know it should be conducive to procreation but even after 10 years in the land of israel they still didn't have children and at that point sarah gives avraham her handmaiden as a sort of surrogate as a sort of surrogate mother or surrogate wife for avraham's children so that's the 10 years if a man married a woman and lived with her for 10 years and she bore no child, he may not abstain. That is to say, he's got to do something about it. Gersha, if he divorced her, if he divorced her, then she can marry another. So it seems that the rabbi recognized that she's not necessarily barren just because she's lived with him for 10 years without having a child. I mean, maybe the rabbis at this point recognize that, you know, either side of a relationship could be the cause of barrenness. And, and this halacha, by the way, I, I, I mean, we could ask, you know, we could ask our rabbinic authorities, but this halacha, I, I think is observed in the breach. I, I, I've never known anyone who divorced his wife after 10 years because they had no children. Rashai Hasheni Lihishotima Esar Shanin, the second person. So she's, let's say she's divorced, she marries a second person. He can live with her for 10 years. And if she has a miscarriage, then we count the 10 years from the time of her miscarriage. A man is commanded about being fruitful and multiplying but not a woman. So that mitzvah seems to be gender specific. And that's very, I mean, with very interesting sociological implications that a woman can take control over her own fertility, that she, according to this Mishnah, and she's not, ob she, she's not obligated. She's not absolutely not obligated in the mitzvah of being fruitful and multiplying. And maybe this, makes sense in a society when economic agency essentially sat with men. Now, Rabbi Yochanan ben Barokia is going to disagree. Rabbi Yochanan ben Barokia, Omer, al shnehehu Omer. Rabbi Yochanan ben Barokia says the verse speaks, or the verse or the mitzvah actually speaks to both of them. It speaks to the man and the woman. And we're going to quote again from Genesis. peru uruvu. I think the verse goes on. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and conquer it. And the rabbis actually learn from the word conquer that, you know, conquering is a thing that men do, but not women. And that's how the, if you like, that is the hook that the rabbis hang. That is the hook on which the rabbis hang the idea that a man is obligated in being fruitful and multiplying, and not a woman. And maybe that the idea that a man uh, conquers and a woman doesn't, maybe that is connected to this, the reality of economic agency of men and women in the time of the Mishnah.